Hello, my friends, and welcome to Not Famous. I don't know if you know the story of the day that the music died. It happened many decades ago. However, it is still to this day a very tragic event, a loss of young life. On February 3rd, 1959, American rock and roll musicians Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the big bopper J.P. Richardson were killed in a plane crash near Clear Lake, Iowa, together with pilot Roger Peterson. The event later became known as the day that the music died after singer-songwriter Don McLean referred to it as such in his uh, hit 1971 song, American Pie. At the time, Holly and his band consisting of Waylon Jennings, Tommy Allsup, and Carl Bunch were playing on the Winter Dance Party tour across the Midwest. Uh, rising artist Valens Richardson, a 17-year-old of age, Paul Anka, and Deanna and the Belmonts had joined the tour as well. The long journeys between venues on board, um, they were cold, uncomfortable. They were on these tour buses, um, and it really impacted them, each of the performers. Uh, cases of the flu and frostbite were pretty common as they were on that tour. So after stopping at Clear Lake to perform, um, frustrated by all these conditions of this travel, Holly chose to charter a plane to reach their next venue, which was in Moorhead, Minnesota. Jennings, suffering from the flu, swapped places with Richardson, taking his seat on the plane, while Alsup lost his seat to Valens on a coin toss, so as reported. Soon after takeoff, late at night, um, and in very poor, wintry weather conditions, the pilot lost control of the very light aircraft, a Beechcraft Bonanza, which subsequently crashed into a cornfield, um, killing all four on board. The event has since been mentioned in several songs and films. Various monuments have been erected at the crash site and in Clear Lake and other places. There's an annual memorial concert that's held at the Surf Ballroom, the venue that hosted their last performances. In November 1958, Buddy Holly had terminated his association with the Crickets. According to Paul Inca, Holly realized he needed to go back on tour again for two major reasons. He needed cash because the Crickets manager, Norman Petty, had apparently stolen money from him, and he wanted to raise monies uh, to move to New York City to live with his wife, uh, Maria, who was pregnant at the time. At the start of their winter dance party tour, Holly assembled a band consisting of Waylon Jennings on the bass, Tommy Allsup on guitar, and Carl Bunch on the drums. The tour was set to cover 24 Midwestern cities in as many days. There were no days off in this tour, my friends. New hit artist Richie Valens, uh, the big bopper J.P. Richardson, and Dion and his band The Belmonts joined the tour to promote their recordings and make some extra profit. The 1959 tour began in Milwaukee, Miss Wisconsin on January 23rd, I believe, with a performance in Clear Lake, Iowa on February 2nd, uh, the 11th of the 24 scheduled events. The amount of travel required uh, soon became a serious problem for the artists. The distance between venues had not been properly considered when the performances were scheduled. Instead of systematically circling around um, the Midwest through a series of venues in close proximity to each other, like, you know, would make sense, uh, the tour kind of, it was erratically meandering around back and forth across the region with distances between some of the tour stops exceeding 400 miles from each other. There were no days off. Like I said, the bands had to travel most of every single day frequently for 10, 12 hours, and in freezing, um, wintry temperatures. Most of the interstate highway system had not even been built yet at that point, so it's kind of a different world than we live in today, my friends. Between bus stops required far more driving time on narrow two-lane rural highways than on modern expressways. Holly said that they didn't care, it was like they threw darts at a map. The tour from hell, that's what they named it. It's not a bad name used for the tour were completely inadequate breaking down and being replaced frequently five separate buses that were used in the first 11 days of the tour they were like reconditioned school buses they were not even good enough for school kids they had to load unload their equipment there was no road crew to assist them um, these buses were just not equipped for this kind of harsh weather i mean at points in time there was waist deep snow in several areas and it was down to like negative seven degrees the bus had a heating system that kept malfunctioning like as soon as the tour bus began 
Richardson and Valens began experiencing flu-like symptoms, and Drummer Bunch was hospitalized for severely frostbitten feet just from riding in these buses after the tour bus stalled in the middle of the highway in sub-zero temperatures near Ironwood, Michigan. On Monday, February 2nd, the tour arrived at Clear Lake, west of Mason City, ever having drove uh, 350 miles from the previous day's concert in Green Bay, Wisconsin. The town in northern Iowa had not been a scheduled stop, but tour promoters hoped to fill the open date, uh, the time frame that they had that was open, called the manager of the local surf ballroom, Carol Anderson, uh, and offered him the show. Anderson accepted, and they set the show for that night, that evening. By the time Holly arrived at the venue that evening, he was frustrated with the ongoing problems with the bus. The next scheduled destination after Clear Lake was all the way in Moorhead, Minnesota, a 365-mile drive north northwest, and it was kind of a reflection of the poor quality of the tour planning. Um, it would take them back directly through two towns that they'd already visited previously on the tour. It just didn't make any sense to travel right back to Iowa, specifically almost directly uh, south to Sioux City, which was going to be another 325-mile trip. So Buddy Holly charters a plane to fly himself and his band to Fargo, North Dakota, um, which is pretty close to Moorhead. The rest of the party would have picked them up and pretty much saved them the journey in the bus and gave him a little bit of time to rest. Club owner Anderson called uh, Hubert Jerry Dwyer, owner of the Dwyer Flying Service in Mason City, to charter the plane to fly to Fargo's airport, uh, the closest one to Moorhead. Flight arrangements were made with Roger Peterson, a 21-year-old local pilot described as a young married man who built his life around flying. The Flying Service charged a fee of $36 per passenger for the flight on the 1947 single-engined Beechcraft Bonanza. It only seated three passengers and a pilot. There are theories or thoughts out there that the plane was named um, the American Pie, but that's not true from what I gather, my friends. And also, $36 um, may not seem like a lot of money, but at that point in time, it was, you know, to some extent what people paid rent um, in a month for it on the lower end. This widely accepted version of the story is that Richardson had contracted the flu during the tour and asked Jennings for his seat on the plane. When Holly learned that Jennings was not going to fly, he said in jest, well, I hope your old bus freezes up. And Jennings responded, well, I hope your old plane crashes. A humorous but ill-fated response that haunted him for the rest of his life. Valens, who once had a fear of flying, asked Alsup for his seat on the plane, and the two agreed to toss a coin to decide won the coin toss for the seat on the flight. Valen remarked that it's the first time he's ever won anything in his life. It's also said that it was his first time flying. I'm not sure if that's actually the case. Show ended that evening. Anderson drove Holly, Valens, and Richardson to nearby Mason City Municipal Airport. Um, the weather at the time of the departure was reported as light snow. It was a ceiling of 3,000 feet. Uh, sky was obscured, visibility about six miles, heavy winds. Although deteriorating, weather was reported along the planned route. The weather briefings uh, Peterson received failed to relay the information. It's thought in many cases that Peterson was not fully informed of how bad the weather was going to be during that flight. The plane took off normally from runway 17, which today is now runway 18, at 12.55 a.m. on Tuesday, February 3rd. Dwyer uh, officials witnessed the southbound takeoff from a platform outside of their control tower. He was able to clearly see the aircraft's tail light for most of the flight, which started with an initial 180 degree uh, left turn to pass east on the airport, climbing to approximately 800 feet. At a.m. when Peterson had failed to make expected radio contact, Repeated attempts to establish communication were made at Dwyer's request by the radio operator, and they were all unsuccessful. Later that morning, Dwyer himself, having heard no word from Peterson since his departure, uh, he took off in another airplane to retrace Peterson's planned route. Within minutes, around 9.35 a.m., he spotted the wreckage less than six miles northwest of the airport. The sheriff's office, alerted by Dwyer, 
dispatch deputy Bill McGill, who drove to the crash site, a cornfield belonging to Albert Jewell. The Bonanza aircraft had impacted the terrain at a high speed. It's believed to have been going around 170 miles per hour at the time. It banked steeply to the right and in a nosedive altitude. A um, tip had struck the ground first, sending the aircraft cartwheeling across the frozen field for roughly 540 feet before coming to a rest against a wire fence at the edge of Jules property. The bodies of Holly and Valens had been ejected from the fuselage and lay near the plane's wreckage. Richardson's body had been thrown over the fence and into the cornfield of Jules' neighbor Oscar Muffet. While Peterson's body was entangled in the wreckage, Peterson being the pilot of that flight, uh, the rest of the entourage en route to Minnesota, Anderson, who had driven the party to the airport and witnessed the plane's takeoff, had to go in and identify the bodies of the musician. County Coroner Ralph Smiley certified that all four victims had died instantly. Uh, Selena Holly learned of her husband's death via a television news report. A widow after only six months of marriage, she suffered a miscarriage shortly afterwards, reportedly due to psychological trauma. Holly's mother, on hearing the news on the radio at home in Lubbock, Texas, screamed and collapsed. Within months of Holly's death, Official protocols uh, were being to be developed with the goal of ensuring that the names of victims of traumatic events incidents are not released by authorities until after their families have been notified uh, for the victims were held individually. Holly and Richardson were buried in Texas, Valens in California, and Peterson, the pilot, in Iowa. Holly's widow, Maria Elena, did not attend the uh, funeral. She later said in an interview, in a way I blame myself. I was not feeling well when he left. I was two weeks pregnant, and I wanted Buddy to stay with me, but he had scheduled that tour. It was the only time I wasn't with him, and I blame myself because I know that if only I had gone along, Buddy would have never gotten into that airplane. An ongoing investigation in the weeks and months after the accident, and also in the years, including more recent years, a lot of the case has been dug back up, re-examined, bodies have been re-exhumed. There's a number of theories about what happened, uh, theories about a gun going off, theories that some of them might have lived and done all this other stuff. That's for you to decide, um, but that is the story of the day that the music died. Make sure to hit the like button, make sure to hit the subscribe button, and if you didn't enjoy this video, still hit the like button. Go ahead, it doesn't cost you anything, my friends. It's really good to talk to you. I'll talk to you guys again very soon. And as always, my friends, adios amigos. Thank you, thank you to the patrons of this channel uh, for making everything awesome. I love you guys. Bye.